There are a lot of things that will modulate your state of focus, but they don't directly mediate your sense of focus. These days, I'm, I have this obsession with trying to do one cognitively hard thing a day. Andrew Huberman, the brilliant mind behind the human psyche, unveils the astonishing secrets to shatter the chains of procrastination that bind us, plunging us into an abyss of unfulfilled dreams and wasted potential. I think times are, are, are changing now. I think people realize that unless, at least what the science shows, that unless people get about five or six sets of reasonably hard work of resistance exercise per muscle group, that they're going to be losing muscle over the course of their lifespan. And so the resistance training is important for maintaining neuromuscular function and for maintaining function of the skeleton. With unwavering determination, Huberman delves deep into the recesses of our minds, exposing the hidden fears and self-doubts that fuel our procrastination, leaving us paralyzed in a cycle of stagnation and regret. So if it's a simple example, like trying to learn a new language or a new motor skill or a new way of conceptualizing something, maybe somebody's in a therapeutic process and they're trying to work through a trauma or something like that, duration, path, and outcome is built into the network. So the brain, we can do that very easily, but it takes work. And it almost has a feeling of underlying agitation and frustration. Through a symphony of scientific insights, he reveals the neurochemical dance between our brains and procrastination, unmasking the destructive patterns that sabotage our progress and suffocate our dreams. So obviously if you train really, really hard and you deplete yourself, you're gonna feel sleepy in the afternoon. Uh, this is another sort of tool type um, scientific factoid, which is that when you train very hard, whether or not it's endurance training or strength training or what have you training, you're directing a lot of oxygen and fuel uh, utilization to the muscles and less goes to your brain. This is the brain fog that you feel in the afternoon or after a hard workout. Huberman's revelations strike like thunder, awakening us to the harsh reality that time slips away while we remain captive to the seductive allure of distractions and excuses. All day long, you're doing things in a reflexive way. But when you do something and you think about it very intensely, acetylcholine is released from basalis at the precise neurons that were involved in that behavior, and it marks those for change mm. during sleep or during deep rest later. With a relentless passion, he imparts the wisdom to overcome the clutches of procrastination, offering practical strategies and mindset shifts that ignite a fire within us, propelling us towards decisive action and transformative change. And so if, if you are forced, for instance, to you force yourself to lift heavy objects or moderately heavy objects three or four times a week, your whole, your whole system of being able to engage muscles is maintained. I will say this, that people who engage in regular resistance exercise and cardiovascular exercise. You see them in their set in their 70s. They they're sharp. They're mentally sharp. Um, now I did say both cardiovascular and resistance exercise. You see people who are just chronic runners or cyclers. They're always complaining about injuries, right? They look like they're going to dissolve into a puddle of tears if they trip on a, on a curb. You know, people who are very large and, and too large for their skeleton you can see it, they have trouble breathing and their cardiovascular system isn't working. So the extremes aren't good, but the behaviors that we engage in send signals back to the other organs of the body, how to react and behave. So I'm a big believer based on the science I know of getting 150 to 200 minutes or so, or so um, of zone two cardio per week. Zone two meaning you could maintain, uh, you know this, but you can maintain conversation, but the heart rate is up. And then doing resistance training, you know, three to four times a week. And I think that creates a balance between the various systems that we're talking about. And, and I should mention that that's my preference, but that preference is based on what we know about uh, from quality peer-reviewed scientific studies, uh, not done by my lab, of what it, what's taken to maintain the skeleton, to maintain the neuromuscular system, to maintain the cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think I think more and more people are talking about that now. The risk of sarcopenia, losing muscle, and and that leading to premature. So we're we're tripping, falling. I mean, we we all you know. I, I'm 46 now, so I don't think about this too much. But you know, when you start to see your parents get into their mid to late 70s, and you start to see notice some um, some frailty. I'm lucky that my parents are in good health, but that one fall can really diminish their 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 well being because they can break bones really easily. Or Huberman's words reverberate with urgency, urging us to seize the present moment and break free from the shackles of procrastination. For in the battle against time, every second lost is an opportunity missed. 
First of all, we have to distinguish between modulators and mediators, and I'll do this very briefly. There are a lot of things that will modulate your state of focus, but they don't directly mediate your sense of focus. So for instance, if right now a fire alarm went off in this building, it would modulate our attention. We would get up and leave. It would be very hard to do what we're doing with that banging in the background, at least at first. So it's modulating focus, but it's not really involved in the mechanisms of focus, right? In the same way, being well rested when you sleep, your autonomic nervous system that adjusts states of alertness and focus and calm works better than when you're sleep deprived. So if you're sleeping better, you're going to focus better. So I always answer this way uh, to a question like this, because the best thing that anyone can do for their mental health, physical health, and performance in athletic or cognitive endeavors or creative endeavors is to make sure that you're getting enough quality sleep enough of the time for you. And that's going to differ. We could talk about what that means. Now, in terms of things that mediate focus, without getting into the description of mechanisms, because we have podcasts about that, it's very clear that mental focus follows visual focus, provided that you're a sighted person. Much of the training that's being done now in China to teach kids to focus better literally has them stare at a target blinking every so often, but really training themselves to breathe calmly and maintain a tight visual aperture. When you read, you have to maintain a tight visual aperture. You're literally scrolling like a highlighter in your mind's eye, right? It's kind of obvious once you hear it. So for people that have problems focusing, sleep well, learn to dilate and contract your visual field consciously. This can be done if you practice it a little bit. And then be as I said before, it is very hard to get into a state of focus like a step function immediately, like snapping your fingers. What you can do is you can pick any object, but ideally an object at roughly the same distance, placed at roughly the same distance to which you're going to do that work. He unravels the intricate web of psychology behind our procrastination, exposing the deeply rooted beliefs and psychological barriers that keep us trapped in a cycle of delay and self-sabotage. I do everything I can to not do email, not do social media and to take care of a few critical tasks. These days, I'm, I have this obsession with trying to do one cognitively hard thing a day, one, and one physically hard thing a day. Now, it does it not extreme physical, not David Goggins level workouts or anything, but um, in that 90 minutes, I'll typically try and read a research article start to finish, or I'll work on a document that I might be doing a grant or research paper or planning a podcast or researching a podcast. I try and get my brain into kind of a linear mode. I try and narrow that aperture. So if I don't, the distraction that's created by social media and interactions with others can kind of wick out into the rest of the day. So I'm not necessarily trying to finish something in that time, but I try and do something challenging. I experience great pleasure from battling through something mentally challenging, but that's something that I built up since my university years when I was about you know 19 or so, got serious about school. and really start to experience the, the deep pleasure of like, oh, I figured that out or like, that was really tough. I don't always succeed, but that's what I'm doing in that hour to 90 minutes. But I confess sometimes we'll take a walk during that time and maybe talk through some things that are that are challenging, you know, or, or sometimes I get lazy and, and I'm, I'll miss a day of that cognitive challenge. Then I do caffeine about um, 90 to 120 minutes um, after waking. And even though I prefer to work out earlier, I generally will then do some sort of physical workout. I have a very consistent routine. I've done it for 30 years where I weight train for 45 or minutes to an hour every other day. And occasionally I take an extra day off mm. and occasionally due to travel or other commitments, I'll occasionally double up two days and then take two days off. Yep. So it's really boring, you know, to talk about workout schedules, but it's really simple. It's like, you know, I'll do a uh, kind of, Pushing day, rest, pulling day, upper body, push up, rest, upper body, pull, rest, and then legs take two days off, something like that.